Hello and welcome to another edition of Jacko's Therapy. So since I've been looking at classic 2D Sonic games for the celebration of the release of Sonic Superstars, I'm going to take a look at another video game series that has another game that has been just been released for the Nintendo Switch. About a certain Italian plumber. That's right, I'm on about Mario. So this is where I'm going to look at all of home console classic 2D Mario games from Super Mario Bros. to Super Mario Bros. U. Now, I'm debating whether I want to look at Super Mario Maker 1 and 2, so if I don't want to waste any more time on them, then let me know. Well, this is actually a new experience for me because i never actually beaten the classic 8-bit 2D Mario games. I have beaten Super Mario World in the new, new games, but I never actually fully have the time to sit down and beat them. But now, since I'm making these series of videos, I finally have an excuse to do so. So for the record, I'll be looking at those on the original Nintendo Wii's Virtual Console. Just holding the Wiimote feels like holding a classic NES controller, and the controls are simple. So, Mario... What can you say about him? He's been so consistent good games from the mainstream series, Mario Kart, Mario Pie, even some sports games. Not only that, he has a load of merchandise, TV shows, and even movies now. Well, the less I say about the 1993 film, the better. But in terms of how I got into the series with games, it's a little bit weird. I think I was first exposed to Super Mario Brothers on these new home console emulators that has all the classic NES games, and Super Mario Brothers is the one I played the most. I played for a bit, and then I just put it down straight afterwards, and I had never touched it again since. Then I think a couple of years later, that Christmas, I owned a Nintendo 64, and one of those games I got was Super Mario 64. Then I played quite a few bit of it, but I never really think that much of Mario after that. Then later down the years, I own a Nintendo GameCube. I didn't fully own Super Mario Sunshine until, like, a few of my friends were talking about it in school. Then I played it. I remember not really liking it that much. So then again, I didn't think that much about it. Then I think on that Christmas period in 2007, where I was in on holiday with my family in the US, found a US store GameStop that has a demo of Super Mario Galaxy, and I absolutely love what I played. So I later on got the game that Christmas, and I think the rest is history. Then you can say I was probably a fan by then. So then after that, I finally have an excuse to finally play the old games. Although I did play a few of them, but I never have the time to sit down and play and beat it. Well, this is where the series of videos comes in, now I have an excuse to do them. Well, this is one of those bucket lists that I've been wanting to do for a long time to finally actually beat those NES games. So shall we take a look how Mario first started? The year is 1981. The video game market was so young back then that people at the time were playing arcade machines before the likes of the NES weren't a thing at the time. Well, the Atari 2600 has been around since the late 70s. So Nintendo want to rival Pac-Man that is so popular at the time, so the video game designer Shigeru Miyamoto, alongside with Gonpei Yokoi to create a game called Donkey Kong. A game about a giant gorilla named Donkey Kong kidnapped a girl named Pauline, or Lady as what she's called in this game, climbed a few floors of a construction building, so our little hero named Jumpman has to climb all the way up to the top while avoiding barrels and other obstacles to save Pauline. So the game has an inspiration for Beauty and the Beast, King Kong and Popeye, which is what Mario is based on. Which, fun fact, Nintendo actually wanted Popeye to be the main character for Donkey Kong, but predictably, they actually failed to do so. As a result, they need to create their own original character, so we have what he's named Jumpman before eventually in the sequel Donkey Kong Jr., he would actually be called Mario. So the original Donkey Kong was a real success, where people put so many changes to play it again and again. Even throughout the years, the game's seen so many ports, and there is even one on the NES where people can play at home all the time. 
So after Donkey Kong Jr, Mario wouldn't make an appearance in Donkey Kong 3 as he's been replaced by Stanley the Exterminator. So Miyamoto and Yokoi wants to experiment with Mario and create his own game after Donkey Kong's success. So here we have Mario Brothers, released in the arcade in 1983. Here you control Mario along with his brother Luigi to work together in an underground sewage in New York to get rid of the turtles by jumping under the floor, flip them upside down, kick them off screen and avoiding fireballs and collecting coins. Well, critically the game was a success, but no one was really interested in it. And that actually resulted in a famous video game crash in 1983 to 1985. So Nintendo decided to release a home console of their own. The Famicom Disk System was released in Japan in 1983. Then they released the Nintendo Entertainment System in the USA in 1985, and then eventually the Europeans get it in 1986. Then Miyamoto, alongside with Takashi Tezuka, developed Super Mario Bros. instead of fighting against a giant gorilla and were not in New York this time. Mario and Luigi sucked into a mysterious pipe that sends them into the mysterious land called the Mushroom Kingdom, with full of mushroom people called Toads ruled by Princess Toadstool, who has been kidnapped by a giant turtle dragon creature named King Cooper or Bowser for Western audience. So Mario and Luigi agree to help the Toads to rescue the princess, though you don't play as them individually as you can only play as Mario when you play a one-player playthrough, or well, you can play as Luigi when you select two player. But there is no difference since the two play exactly the same. The end result has been unbelievable success. It's really you have to thank this game for putting the video game market back on the map, and we probably wouldn't have seen any video games today. Not to mention the game's been sold over 40 million copies, even being bundled with the NES. With good graphics and music composed by Koji Kondo, with the most famous track in video game history. I mean, honestly, how on earth would no one would know the actual Super Mario Brothers theme? And if you don't, I know you're lying. So with all that history lesson, what do I think of the game itself? So you control Mario in this stretch level design while jumping over blocks, jumping on enemies, collecting coins and collect power-ups. So the controls are really simple, not only do you have a jump button, but you also have a run button, which is really helpful for clearing stages quickly considering you're under a time limit. You can also carry momentum when you run really fast, especially when jumping. Although it's really easy to lose yourself unless you try to position yourself for landing. This problem is more of my own fault really, since I've been playing other games that involves moving really fast. Scattered in every level are blocks that contains coins, which also hangs around in every level, which can earn an extra life by collecting a hundred of them. Also inside the blocks are power-ups. The first you come across is a mushroom, which makes you grow and also an extra hit. And if you get hit while you're small, you lose an extra life. So do yourself a favour and find it and make your life a lot easier. Next is the fire flower, which you can only collect after getting the mushroom, where you can shoot fireballs out of your hands, which is awesome, the best power up you can get in this game. Oh, and you can also use fireballs underwater. Because you can. Last of all is the power stars, which you can make you invincible in it for a few seconds. So with all the power ups at your arsenal, but you need to get past these levels that contain Goombas, which only walk side to side and don't do anything else. Koopa Troopers, which are exactly like Goombas, but after defeating them, you can kick their shell side to side. Though you need to be careful if you're close to a pipe or a brick wall, otherwise you lose a power-up or death. And sometimes they walk around with wings. Piranha Plants coming in and out of pipes, but they don't come out when you stand next to or on, on top of the pipe. And that's pathetic. Then Buzzy Beetles, which are like Koopa Troopers, but they're immune to the Fire Flower. Bloopers and Cheap Cheeps underwater. You can also encounter Cheap Cheeps jumping out of the water in bridge levels. Bullet Bills, which has unpredictable fire patterns when they're about to come out. Which can be the worst enemy in the game because of it. Finally, the worst of all, the Hammer Brothers. They throw hammers all over the place in front of you, which can be awkward to kill unless you have the Fire Flower and sometimes they meet you in pairs. Oh, and when you meet them in pairs with a narrow set of blocks, they can also jump up and down between them. They may as well be bosses, even better than Bowser himself. 
In order to get to Bowser, you have to travel four levels in each of the eight worlds in order to get to Bowser and rescue the princess. Each first levels in each world are regular levels with few different obstacles and enemy placements. And also at times you'll be chased by Lakitus that throw spinies on top of you, which are for the most part no problem. Second levels contain underground areas where it's dark and congested with blocks on the ceiling, with also more blocks in the way and enemies in front of you. Second levels also contain water levels where you swim through avoiding bloopers and cheap cheeps or even kill them with fireballs. In third worlds you've been jumping on top of treetops and mushrooms which is where the game gets a bit platform heavy. Another alternate third levels you can also run across the bridge avoiding jumping cheap cheeps that mess up your jumps and so keep that in mind. And finally the fourth level you're in one of Bowser's castles while trying to avoid firebars, jumping across bottomless pits and fireballs coming out of lava which is also up on this bit, so it may as well be. Though some Bowser castles have a maze where you have to find the correct path, otherwise the stage loops over and over again. And finally, you will be fighting Bowser at the end where he shoots fireballs. In later worlds, he can also throw hammers into the mix, and for some strange reason, it's easier to avoid than Hammer Brothers. And I can't really explain why, or maybe just me. After you defeat Bowser, you go into the next room where you find one of the Toads that have been held captive by Bowser's minions, and then tells you that the princess is in another castle. Well, get used to it folks, you are going to be seeing this seven more times before you can rescue her. Though in the first seven castles, you weren't really fighting Bowser, which are enemies in disguise. So as I said in the beginning, I never ever in my life beaten this or any other old 8-bit games. In a few times I played it, I used warp zones and to skip other worlds to beat the game faster. But I lost the urge to do it since this game is pretty difficult. But it doesn't help that you only have three lives in this game. You lose them all, then it's a game over and it's back right to the beginning of the game with no continues. Well, you do in a way. You are back to the title screen and all you have to do is hold A and then press start and then you are back to the beginning of the world you died in and not the actual level. I guess continues weren't a thing back then, so they have to use a cheat. So that's what I did in this playthrough. For the record, I did not use warp zones this time around. I play through the game from beginning to end legitimately and use the continue cheat when I get a game over. So here I am, got through world 1 through 4 with no problem. World 5 to 6 is where it gets a bit more challenging, but again, no real issue there. Then I got to World 7 is where it gets really challenging, more specifically the first stage. I actually think this is my least favourite level in the game, mainly because of Bullet Bill's cannons being placed and also it's so unpredictable pattern when they're going to shoot. But the rest are not so bad. Finally, World 8. Obviously the hardest world in the game, only because enemy placements and leap of faith moments, but I think they overdone it here. So I did get a few game overs in this world. If I wasn't even doing these videos, I probably would have given up and played something else. So I pressed on and on and on and on. And after 30 minutes later, I made it to Bowser's final castle with one life remaining. One life. Yes, I found the right one. Oh shit, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm in the water section. God, I must be close. Alright, get this hammer brother out of the way. Five all the way! Alright, Bowser, time to die! Oh. oh god! I did it! I finally did it! Oh. And finally, I beat Super Mario Brothers for the first time ever. This means a lot to me because I've seen many gamers out there saying it was their first video game they ever played and beaten. From someone like me that didn't grow up in the 80s, it's a great experience of having fun and frustration when it comes to playing games like this back then. 
I feel the pressure when I play through the last castle with one life because I so badly want to beat this game for the first time ever and I was considering stopping if I get a game over it because I don't want to suffer playing through World 8 over and over again. When I beat it, I couldn't believe it. I actually beat Super Mario Brothers. But anyway, after defeating Bowser, you finally rescue the princess and as a reward, she presents you a second quest which enemies are two times faster and Goombas are replaced by Buzzy Beetles. It can also have a world select in the option screen in the title screen. But if you want a superior version of this game, I recommend the Super Mario Bros. All-Stars port for the Super Nintendo, a compilation of games that contain Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, 3 and Lost levels. This game also gets a 16-bit graphics which added backgrounds, also the music. And best of all, you actually have a save feature. Though you will start at the beginning of the world you died in if you get a game over. I also love the added personality when after beating the castle where you rescue the number of toads you saved, there is also another port on the Game Boy Color called Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, where in a strange way it is the best and worst version of this game. The best being you have an actual world map where if you get a game over you actually start the actual level you died in. The worst being while the game has carried the NES original graphics, the camera is a problem meaning you have no idea where you're going to land or jump away above ground, which could be a pro problem for jumping on enemies or bottomless pits. So this version can be the worst port because of that. But at least the save feature makes up for it. So my overall experience with Super Mario Bros. is actually pretty good. Well, with some levels can be really difficult at times, but I'm not sure if gamers nowadays can actually enjoy this but I'm pretty sure they understand what this game achieved back then, and even now. So now I've finally beaten one of the original games, it pretty much gets easier from now on, right? What? What? what, what why are you looking at me like that? It does... It's a pretty easy stroll now, right? Oh, come on, I'm pretty sure it won't be that bad. But anyway, with all that said, I will see you guys next time, and take care of yourselves.